Hello and welcome to 7 Days of Science. Coming up this week, I reveal what makes the perfect day. Either 2 to 3 cups of coffee or 3 to 5 cups of tea per day, Ben is asked to describe the Benji Thomas channel. A phenomenon. And I say Sunday. Sunday. <laughs> Starting off the news this week, for a final time, probably, we're taking a look at the UN COP26 Climate Summit. The summit was wrapped up this week and the Glasgow Climate Pact was signed. The deal naturally goes much further than the Paris Climate Agreement, and it is the first climate deal to specifically target coal, which is the worst fossil fuel when it comes to greenhouse gases. However, despite earlier drafts of the deal containing a commitment to totally phase out coal, in the end, countries agreed to phase down coal usage rather than phase it out, after an India-China-led push to oppose the phase-out wording. This last-minute change has somewhat tainted the perceived success of the talks, and while many world leaders have praised the efforts of all nations present and hailed the conference as a success, many have also expressed their displeasure at these changes. While the Glasgow Climate Pact does go much further and is more ambitious than the Paris Climate Agreement, more will have to be done in order to reach the 1.5 degrees C goal. In other news, an extensive study published in the journal PLOS Medicine this week shows that coffee and tea consumption were linked with a lower risk of stroke and dementia. The team was made up of researchers from Tianjin Medical University and Yale University and looked at over 350,000 participants all the way back from 2006. It was found that the group that drank either two to three cups of coffee or three to five cups of tea per day had the lowest counts of stroke or dementia, in both cases around 30% lower. The researchers are confident in the validity of their findings, but say that it is yet unclear whether or not this information can improve stroke and dementia outcomes. And now over to Ben with the paleontologicalology stories. Thanks, Doug. Also in the news of the last week has been the naming and description of a new genus and species of hadrosauriform dinosaur from England, meet Brystonius simmonsi. Named after the village of Brystone on the Isle of Wight near where it was found, as well as the man who discovered the fossils, Keith Simmons, this new dinosaur is notable for possessing a relatively long snout with a nasal bulla, essentially an expanded nasal, similar to what's seen in Mutabarasaurus but not as prominent. Various other features of the skeleton are found to be unique too, and a fair amount of the skeleton of this dinosaur has actually been recovered, including many parts of the skull, quite a few different vertebrae, 14 ribs, a lot of the hip, and a right femur. Plus, there are apparently more parts of the same individual that are currently held in private ownership. The paper explains how for almost a century the hadrosauriforms from the Beremian to Aptian of the Wielden group were only represented by Iguanodon and the more gracile Mantellisaurus, but now, Brystonius indicates that the diversity of these animals was actually higher than we'd realised, as is also hinted at by recent discoveries from Spain too. The paper also urges that a reassessment of Mantellisaurus material be carried out, suggesting that more changes to the hadrosauriform taxa of Cretaceous England may be occurring in the future. Anyway, it's a very exciting discovery that once again shows how important the Isle of Wight is in the study of dinosaur paleontology. And finally, there's been a very interesting study looking at the rate of evolution in the history of squamates, the lizards, snakes, and amphisbanians, compared to the Rhynchocephalians, which today includes just the Tuatara. The paper explains how work from 1944 proposed the idea that fast evolution could cause instability and extinction, whereas slow evolution leads to high biodiversity. This new study finds some evidence to support this claim, and finds that evolutionary rates can vary significantly throughout the history of a single clade. Specifically, looking at squamates, which comprise about 10,000 living species, they were found to have relatively slow rates of evolution for the first two-thirds of their evolutionary history. On the other hand, Rhynchocephalians, which of course contains just one living species, displayed faster evolutionary rates in the past, seemingly supporting this old idea about evolutionary rates. It's a very interesting idea and hopefully more research will be done on it in the future, helping to identify if there really is support for such a phenomenon in other organisms. Back to Doug in the studio. Thank you, Ben. Well, that's it for this week's Seven Days of Science. I do hope you enjoyed, and as always, we'll see you on Sunday. <laughs>